you're tuned in to Death Metal Chronicles. Today is June the 24th, a Wednesday, and it is 02.50 a.m. I swear to God, I just cannot figure out how to sleep during the nighttime. It, it just doesn't work. Whenever I try, I end up, you know, sleeping at like 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning and then getting up at like 3. I don't know. My, my life is completely jacked. So I had physical therapy the other day. And they do this thing where they take like a piece of metal and literally separate your um, tendons and like muscle from like your freaking body. And I guess it's supposed to like help you get loose or something like that. They have like these special terms for it. But I just, I, it just blows my mind. Like I don't understand how it's supposed to work. But I guess it does. But then I have to sleep for like 13 hours to heal. And it's crazy. I'll sleep for like a really long time and wake up so yeah don't ever hurt yourself or get hurt overseas have to go to physical therapy because you're fucked and then you'll have to get physical therapy and all that and that's eh, not good so i was reading on soft rep um they had a uh, article defining the modern day mercenary uh, this is from jay i think his name's jay reed i guess he's a a british contractor i've only met like three or four british guys so far they're decent I don't know, some of them don't really like Americans, but that's, that's maybe this guy likes Americans, I don't know. But here's his ideas. I've seen a lot of hype in the press on social media networks about the modern-day mercenary. The mainstream media uses the term mercenary to describe anyone other than military or press in conflict zones. I find this to be slightly irritating because there have been many changes to the ways in which wars are fought today. In this day and age, we see private military contractors, PMCs, risk management consultants, and the new trade of volunteer soldiers on the battlefield. Now, in some shape or form, all of these have a place in the modern-day conflict zone. PMCs are brought in to provide security work as armed guards, provide close protection, and train host nation forces. The same applies to risk management firms now, from what I can see, and this hardly means that they should be branded with the title mercenary. They are there providing security services to the client, and it is made no different from a security company here in the UK or the US, providing security services to a client based in their home country. If not, then the security guard standing in the local shopping store is a mercenary. But from the look of them, I highly doubt that. So why do we brand them as the Merc tagline? We did during the gold rush days of Iraq in 2003 to 2009. Back then, PMCs were brought into the vacuum of the U.S. government, but even then, we're not talking about direct operations. They are brought in to conduct security services by the government by providing things like close protection, static security guards, and convoy protection. All these same services can be hired in the U.S. or the U.K. from a security provider. And he goes on and kind of details out the different types of... uh, of places and and different types of jobs there are within security contracting. I appreciate his viewpoint because there's not a lot of British guys out there, at least that I've seen within the media, um, you know, talking about, you know, what it really is to be a security contractor. And someone like for him in, in Europe, um, 100% you're evil, you're a mercenary, you're bad, you kill babies and, you know, eat children and shit. Um, so I find it really important that he is, you know, speaking out. And another distinction I think we, sh- what he made inside of his post was about the volunteer military and how that they are mercenaries. Well, technically, in the context of someone being paid as a professional soldier to fight on behalf of something that is not a cause of their hometown, I would say that person is a mercenary also. And that just has a different viewpoint, but it is true. So if your town isn't being taken on by some sort of invading force, if you're getting paid to go fight, the idea of the mercenary does exist. Now, on another post of Pharrell Jundi, he has a, a website you guys can check out as well. Uh, He was talking about air power and how right now in Iraq, um, they were kind of wondering, you know, how many um, joint terminal air controllers. So a JTAC is somebody who is on the ground. They see 
there's like a bunch of guys coming at their uh, position and they're going to attack. Well, the JTAC would then call over to whatever uh, drones or helicopters or planes and directly tell these guys, hey, these guys are here at this place. Drop your bombs and kill them. Okay, so he was talking about how he doesn't really know how many JTACs were actually out there. And I told him, well, you know, number one, they've been there the entire time. And this sort of whole flame war on on Facebook, like it always does. I can't stand Facebook anymore. It makes me so angry. Um, and, and how that, you know, in Iraq, there's probably no JTACs or anything at all. But the fancy guys, as I call them, any of the team guys, they're not just going to not be somewhere. Anytime there's a problem... They're going to be under the guise of Coca-Cola or Texaco or, you know, some sort of oil company or whatever. Whether they're clandestine or in the open, they're going to be somewhere that's going to have a conflict because America has to maintain dominance over whatever area that we want to control. So in terms of foreign policy, this idea that, oh, no, uh, the Iraqis need to be saved and they're defenseless. There's no one there. Well, sorry to break it to you, but America's empire is that big now that you name the country, we're there. Whether it's Argentina, Chile, uh, Bulgaria, Belarus, you name the country, there's some sort of American either giving in information or assisting that country unreluctantly probably to the home country, but that's just how big the American empire is now. So, but I think the JTAC idea is really freaking cool. I'd actually like to get some training on it. I'm not exactly as smart as that kind of person. Um, this is where you're, you have to have both skills. You have to have the skills to operate the machinery, which handles the lazing of targets, which is, you know, um, oh God, I barely can explain it. Basically, you shoot a laser and you find out the distance of the area and then how far that you'd have to shoot a specific load of, of weaponry or whatever. Yeah, this is beyond my skill set. Um, so amongst that, then you also have to be able to do that on paper as well as with digital tools, um, which is highly, highly important. Um, and it's a very important job. Um, I mean, if you're being overrun, you need a JTAC. I mean, you can have some grunt calling it out, but the you know f-16 guy that's really really high up may not have the ability to um to do that now one thing that i was talking about in my post as well um my comments was the fact that you don't necessarily need a jtac now specifically to take out targets on the ground because our world is much smaller now that we have radar sonar um different types of rf technology um, drones, satellites, um, the triangulation of cell phones. Uh, you really don't, I mean, you do need them. Yes, it's a very important job if you're if you're on a sp- small mission and you're out there. But if you're not necessarily doing that, you don't really need that person specifically. So the, the, I guess what I'm saying is they need less JTACs, not more. Um, because the technology is advanced so far that you really don't have to have as many of them. Um, moving on from that, my buddy, Kerry Patton, he had an article. Um, I forget what website he hosts on the Havoc Journal. Um, Spotlight a contrarian view towards Israel. Please do not flame <laughs> or post your ridiculous comments because I will not reply to them. You can go on and on and on about how great, whatever. So, and this is his portion of it, so uh, for his first start. If you are an I support Israel type person, be forewarned. The odds are you will hate this article. This is not an anti-Semitic article. It has nothing to do with the religion or the Jewish faith. It has everything to do with the politics, policies, and practices of an actual nation state, Israel. Just like you can hate all Christians... But it doesn't mean every Christian's American, and even though supposedly America is a Christian country, don't blame every Christian on what America does. Because there are people, like myself and other people who are Mennonites, who really don't want to have anything to do with the United States government, because they're always getting us into dumb shit all the time. That's why a bunch of people went to jail. 
uh, during World War One and World War Two who were Amish and Mennonites because they weren't putting up with it. So we'll put that statement there because that's included in that. Um, and I'll go on to Kerry Patton's post. If you have the ability to separate your passion and everything you do, be socially conditioned to believe. You have been socially conditioned to believe. You may just realize why Israel, the nation state, is not an ally to the United States. The blow should not be considered anti-Semitic, but rather a brief history lesson, which will hopefully allow some open-minded persons think about whether Israel should be considered a true friend of the United States. Israel is all about propaganda and spies. Our most concern, their claimed number one ally of the United States, seems to be their greatest target. As readers will learn, Israel was not a true ally, but rather a potential backstabbing enemy to the United States. In 1987, Naval Intelligence Officer Jonathan Pollard was caught selling thousands of secrets to the Israelis. Israel denied these allegations pertaining to Pollard working for Israel. However, a decade later, Israel confirmed his, his activities. Israel apologized and promised not to spy on the U.S. soil again. Once then, more Israeli spies have been arrested and convicted by U.S. courts, according to Newsweek. So, in the intelligence field, if you're not very familiar, your enemy is your enemy, and your friend is your friend, and everybody's always backstabbing each other. <laughs> if, if you can put it in those terms, that it's all smoke and mirrors, and everybody's finding out information on each other. In a way, I would call it positive evil, Okay. Uh, you know, positive evil within the hacker community is anything that is not disclosed will be found out. It doesn't matter if it's bad or good. You're going to find it out. Uh, as cancerous cells are in the body, they attach themselves, the good cells, convincing the good cells that they're good and then, you know, converting it to cancerous cells. The same way is intelligence within Israel. Why wouldn't Israel want to find out what AT&T communications or um, level three communications was runs the entire backbone of the United States? Um, in, a, in a link that Kerry also put in there was about the story of, I think it's called El Biet Systems, which was a telecommunications company in the 1990s, who's now changed their name like three or four times. They're a different company now. But before, what they were doing is they're collecting incoming and outgoing phone calls. And then this is in the first earlier databases of t- cell phone communications and essentially using real-time analytics to find out who you were calling and what you're doing. So you'd use multiples of three or more, and then you'd collect that and then find out who... who people were contacting. So what the Israeli government was doing is then trying to subvert uh, the U.S. Congress and other other politicians and then gaining dirt on them to find out how they can use that person as a source to find out what the United States government was doing. Why wouldn't you do that? That's intelligence 101. You go to a country, you, uh, you know, find some politician in a coffee shop, you befriend the guy, oh yeah, my name is John Brown. I fucking love coffee too. Oh, great. Yeah. And you talk to that guy and you find out how many kids he's got, what he's doing. Then you find out that he's banging his maid. And then you use that information on the guy. Hey, you're banging your maid, Maria. Uh, you need to tell me what the next bill is coming out or what is going on with whatever. This is the same kind of thing that the Israeli government is doing in America. Why wouldn't they? I mean, that's it's in your best interest to find out industrial information uh, computer information, whatever it would be, can be used. It doesn't have to be bad. It's just it is, um, and it's what our government does all around the world. You name the country, we're doing it, and we're doing it in Israel too. I can bet you one hundred percent there's probably a hundred dudes right now in Israel trying to develop sources either on the Palestinian Palest- Palestinian side or on the Israeli side and trying to gain information on what's going on in Israel or in Palestine and trying to use that information for positive or for, you know, bad. Um, Now, what I think is interesting is that on Kerry's post, everything that happened after that on all the comments was 100% negative about how he's some sort of anti-Semitic person and that he hates the Jews. 
Well, number one, it has nothing to do with the Jewish faith. The Jewish faith is not represented by Israel. The Jewish faith is represented by the people who practice Judaism. And we can also say that's Christians too. Christians practice Judaism. So are all Christians, are all the people of Israel or all the people of, of uh, any other Christian nation supposed to be hated because of what the Israeli government does? Absolutely not. Nor should us uh, Americans be flamed for, you know, what the Israeli or United States government does because we don't speak for uh, the religion itself. Um, And in the just war ideology, if Palestine actually was harmed by the United States, they should go to war with the United States. And they may not believe in the just war theology of Judaism, but it is highly important, and you guys should take a look at it, um, that would go forth, and I think, on another one that carries things, maybe somebody else, they're talking about how one of the ca- the Pope of the Catholic Church is speaking out against arms manufacturers and um, their use of selling weapons. And me being kind of judgmental, I, I put on one of my comments, well, the guy obviously needs to read the just war theory. It's kind of insensitive, but it is true. So if you're a Catholic and you believe in the just worth theology, which most Catholics probably would say that they do, especially if they support the state, um, countries, that you should believe in the just worth theory, which is anybody who punches you, you should fucking punch them and destroy them. So someone that brings violence to you, you bring violence to them. But you don't just go up to your neighbor and punch him for no reason, okay? So somebody, you know, takes your tie. You're just by taking your tie back to that person, back from that person. Um, in the same thing of state-on-state state violence or even uh, people upon state violence, um, bringing violence to them, that's something that you should take a look at because it is highly important to, to separate out um, what is a just war and what is not. That's why the Amish and Mennonites refused to join World War One and World War Two and be drafted because they were like, fuck this, we're not putting up with it, you people are full of shit. Um, in my language. Um, I, look at it if you guys want. I think it's interesting. My next topic of today is about Taylor Swift. And I think that is really interesting that she's um, speaking out against the different media platforms and them not hosting her music and not allowing her to receive the just compensation that she is due. Now, a lot of people would say, Oh God, she's the fucking, you know, six, six, six mark of the beast. Uh, worst music ever in the world. Um, she gets paid an exorbitant amount of money or whatever. What they're not looking at is the fact that she directly hires over 50 people or more, number one, to handle any of the the stuff that she does in the media. There's no possible way that it's just her on her own doing these concerts, doing her mic checks, you know, setting up her band, traveling, doing all her media production. So for her, it's a huge impact. If she doesn't get 600,000 people um, total views on a video of hers, she doesn't make that, that revenue. And she has to have that revenue to pay the people that she hires to support her. Um, I was talking about on one of my posts, I thought it would be really interesting if Taylor Swift would get out of whatever contract that she's in, only play, I I was going to say DIY house shows, which for her would be, you know, some sort of field and you would just schedule out, uh, you know, playing in a farm or a field or something like that. And you would just do it yourself and a scale for her would be pretty big. But if she did that, she would be able to make 100% of the proceeds of her music. And also I think it'd be really awesome if she started doing that for other people. So for us unsigned artists, for her to make her own music distribution platform, which allows people to get in 100%, not what you know YouTube does. They only give you a certain percentage of what you're earning from what you're doing on their platform, but to provide a space for unsigned artists to put their music 
and distribute also internationally. Because for me, uh, with my band, Key and Anchor, I don't have the ability to put my stuff on, on iTunes right now. It would cost me a lot of money, and I definitely don't have the ability to put out my music in Japan. That's impossible right now. I would not have the money to be able to send my money or send my music out to Bulgaria or Belarus or anything like that just because of how much money it would have to take on and it would just negate uh, my ability to play uh, any of the, the songs that I do. Um, and also if I, you know, with the artists that I'm, I'm playing with, I wouldn't have the ability to pay them either um, if we did monetize our stuff through at least on YouTube or something like that and with iTunes. There's just no way we all could pool our money to do that right now. Um, so, if, I mean, if Taylor Swift ends up hearing this by somebody else, talking about it through somebody else, it's a fucking sweet idea. You start your own music platform and you start doing DIY stuff where you refuse to be part of the music system which currently revolves around today where you go to... Um, say Def Jam Music or Island Music or Universal. Um, And they front you. And for someone like her, they would front her about $2 million. And she's in debt for the $2 million for, um, say, five records that she would have to produce. She has to do five albums with only $2 million fronted to her and has to get a van has to pay for 50 people, has to have a professional or two professional drivers because there's no possible way you can go from one show to the next and tour for 12 or for 11 months out of the year, um, play all those shows, handle her media. It's completely impossible. Um, so, I mean, if someone like that were able to, to do positive evil and disrupt the system of music, it'd be pretty interesting and i th- i think it would it would greatly enrich the rest of us who don't want to be part of the, the regular music system and want to provide a good product for the people who listen to our music because fuck the music industry um there's not a good idea in taking on a hundred thousand five hundred thousand however much money of debt just to put out a record and tour indefinitely for 11 months out of the year never see your family and be completely broken so, something to think about. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the band. I don't remember their name. Um, so, I'm going to look it up after I end this episode. And I hope you guys enjoyed the music. Um, please check them out on um, their band camp or their Facebook. I will link them in the notes below. I've done this for my car now for the fourth time because it's really loud in my house. And also, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. So, I hope you guys enjoy. And... Shout outs to my uh, Mexican buddy out there in the shit. Uh, also to my buddy who's back here in DC, who just got back from Afghanistan, and my Ranger buddy who is out there teaching uh, frontal. Hope you guys enjoy. Goodbye, government.